Welcome to our panel discussion on the wildly popular Korean TV show distributed by Netflix, The Squid Game. And I, I'm, I hope that some of you have seen the, the shows or you haven't seen that, that you are interesting about the show. I hope that you enjoy today's discussion. And this panel discussion contextualize the culture and social and cinematic significance of the popular show, Squid Game. And each the panelist, they all have different background, different kind of academic training. They have different kind of live experience and they're gonna analyze and contextualize the Squid Game from their own vantage point and also their academic interests as well. And um, so I would like to thank um, Emily McKellar who designed a beautiful flyer, the Squid Game, and so you have seen, again, if you have seen the show, you will know the symbolism of, of some of the, the images that she presented in the flyer. And I would also like to thank Dinah De La Cruz for helping us managing today's panel discussion. And also a special uh, thanks to our panelists who are very, very busy and they graciously accepted my invitation. So we'll have Dr. Mobach from the Communication Studies Department. Again, he's a media studies scholar, and also Dr. Rob Metz, who is also an expert on film study, who actually wrote a, a, a paper and won a top paper award in, in one of the media um, conferences. And so that he's gonna present uh, his an analysis of this weekend from his top paper. And we also have Professor Bami Huang, who teaches Korean language. So she's going to look at this um, show from the language and culture perspective. And um, we also have Dr. Um, H.K. O, who is a, uh, a professor in kinesiology. And she's also the faculty director of international study and program. And so she was also going to look at the, the, the show from the, um, you know, kind of the, um, the game and play and, you know, from um, her own personal experience too, because she plays some of the games that they discuss in, in, in the show. And so they will have their own personal insight on, on this show. And then I hope that you'll find today's presentation very riveting. I would also like to thank Dr. Um, Young, Taewon Young, who is also very busy and he's the chair of finance department. And um, so he will help uh, introducing the, the speak, each speakers and also help facilitating today's uh, discussion, especially the Q and A session as well too. I would also like to thank all the audience who are attending our today's discussion on Squid Game. I hope you, you find something interesting from today's discussion and please also feel free to ask us questions during the Q&A session. So without further ado, then I will then turn the, um, the, the mic or the, uh, the floor, yield the floor to Dr. Taewon Yang who will then uh, introduce each speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chuang. Uh, the dean of uh, college. Okay, so I really wish, I hope you guys receive secret invitation from this uh, meeting, like a, a quiz game. And also that we are really looking for making money, hopefully, <laughs> I'm just kidding, but it's a, it's a major kind of starting point of a street game. So a lot of uh, actor and actress receive kind of a secret invitation and then they start to compete uh, to survive and get awards. So anyway, this uh, Squid, game, uh, Squid Game has a lot of impact and influence on the literature and uh, kind of our understanding on Asian culture. So today, actually, we will discuss those topics more deeply. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chuang uh, shared, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists' uh, background and information. So I'll go for alphabetic order. Uh, so uh, first, Dr. Peck. Uh, Dr. Beck is a professor of communication studies, uh, specializing in entertainment media use and effects. Uh, he's known to take social scientific approaches in his media research. His topic today is appeals and impacts of squid, uh, squid game as media entertainment. Uh, professor Bo Mi Hwang uh, is a professor on Korean language and literature 
uh, she will uh, talk about Squid Game on the social, cultural, and literal, uh, literary perspective. Uh, professor Matt is a film uh, study professor. Uh, uh, the, he will present his paper on Squid Game, uh, spatial uh, dialectics. Uh, it's a withering uh, mass ornament and other large objects in the frame. And lastly, uh, Dr. O oh is a professor of, of kinesiology. Uh, she will present uh, the game aspects of a squid game and her childhood memories of playing some of the game featured in the show and societal changes. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so anyway, it's actually the, it is time to pick up the order of the presentation. So, uh, Dr. O, oh, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, everyone can see my screen? Yes, thumbs up. Yes, thank you. All right, thanks, Dean Chong, and thanks, Dr. Yang, for the nice introduction. And again, uh, my name is Dr. Hyun Kyung Ho, oh, Professor of Kinesiology and faculty director at the Center for International Studies and Programs. And again, I'd like to thank Dean Chung for giving me this opportunity to talk in this panel discussion. And I am from South Korea. As Dean Chung mentioned, I grew up playing these games presented in the drama Squid Game. Uh, when I was watching the drama the first time it was featured on Netflix, I was very reminiscing about the good old days of those memories with my friends and also my brother. And after Dean Chong asked me for this panel discussion, so I watched a few episodes again, and then the title of my presentation kind of occurred to me. So I will be talking mm -hmm. about corruption of play and the recovery of the play spirit. All right, so let's move to the next one. So I'm sure you all know play, game, and sports. And although these words are sometimes interchangeable, and there is a distinct difference between play, game, and sports. So today I will be presenting the definition of play and game, but not so much about the sports. So here are two famous definitions of play. The first, Hoisinger defined the play as a free activity, which is not serious with no material interest. And the other one is the Lubin and his colleague also defined the play as a behavior that is intrinsically motivated, focused on the means rather than ends or the free from the externally imposed rules. So basically the play is a non-utilitarian physical or intellectual activity that is pursued for its own sake. And that is to say the pleasure is in the doing rather than the achievement of some object. And play can be spontaneous or organized. So here's the one example. Let me play this one. And uh, I don't know why this video is not so um, clear in here. But anyway, so one of my nephew playing drums with the twigs on the street road. And this is the perfect example of the spontaneous play. He's just enjoying and doing whatever he's doing it in the moment. So there is no reward or whatsoever. It's just the fun. And another example in here, and these are my twin nephews playing one of the squid games and call it as a dakji. Okay. So this dakji has a more rules or I call it as a more organized play. So you saw two different spontaneous play and also the organized play. When, uh, not you again, so when play is more organized, we call this as a game. The game has a set of rules, regulations, and constraints. And also the game can be non-comparative or comparative. 
And here I show the one of the pictures of the tag game everyone knows and everyone knows how to play it. But just in case those who do not know the tag game, tag game is the one person is a it and then the rest of the players try to avoid the being tagged. Once you've been tagged, you might be freezed in a place or become it and chase other players. So tag game is a good example of non-comparative game. And we just play, we do have a rules, we have some regulations, but still it is fun activity. Let's talk about the games of marbles. And marble can be defined as a game because no matter how you play, the marble has a set of rules and regulations. And when I was grow up, typically the rules are we, you, we have to have a ring and inside of the marble, put it right there. And, and also the one of them should be a shooter or the smasher. So just to throw the marble in the circle of the rings and it's hit it and put it out and it will be the out and you take the marbles from there, right? So the steel marble, uh, compared to the marble and tagging game, tagging is more non-comparative and also the marbles are more comparative, right? And then when the game gets comparative, we call, I mean, we as a kinesiologist or the physical educator, we call this game as a contest because the contest comes with some reward at the end. Either you get a nice trophy, nice badge, or you win the money like from the squid game. However, can we call this squid games marvel? as a contest? Uh, some of might say yes, because they will eventually get a money or not get killed by uh, the, all those masked men here. But it will get more violent later, right? So, so this is the how I created, and it's not my ideas. And there is a Dr. Goodman who is a professor of English and American studies. And interestingly, who also wrote 10 books about the sports history. He presented this diagram in his famous book called The Rules of Game. So in here, and he argued all forms of sports and game drive from play which can be divided into the spontaneous and organized. I already explained. When the play gets organized, we call this as a game. And game also has a two aspects, which were non-comparative and the comparative. And we already discussed the comparative game and we call it as a contest. The contest can be intellectual and physical. When the contest game gets physical, we call this as a sport. All those games that you saw on the squid game, it's physical game. But can we call these games as a sport? Some of might say no. Sports never kill someone. Sports gets never bloody big too much, right? So as I mentioned earlier, I played these games for fun. However, the creator of the squid game twist the, the lovely children's play into the deadly gladiators game to show the corruption of play. So that's how I interpret how this children's fun play and corrupt it. And I'm gonna show you more examples. So all those games, the recruiters game, Takji, red light, green light, and also the Dalgona, which is the Bobki, tug of war, marble, and the final squid games that I played when I was young. But in this play, I mean the drama. So one of the uh, the corruption example that I can present in here is the recruiters game Takji, because the recruiters comes with his own set of dakji. And obviously he, he played and he's well-trained in these games. However, when he meets the other person, he presented this like 
he never played before, or he's presenting as he and other players are even playing field. But it was not even, right? So that's why all those contestants were recruited and participate in the game. On the other hand, there is a Dakji or the Dalgona. And traditionally, traditionally uh, if the person buying one Dalgona and also manage to eat around the shape in the middle without breaking it, and we will receive the second one for free. However, the players in the squid game, the reward for successful eating was a survivor. The punishment of the failure was death. So these are the kind of common metaphor I think the creator kind of deliver to the audience, all the life experience and game structure as a struggle struggle for the possession or with the goal of overcoming a player in a position of control, there are often stories about the social aspiration and the limited social mobility that I was perceiving. What about the end? The squid game, we, I already said the loser is the death. The winner is the winner of the prize of the money. However, at the end, the final winner does not use the prize money for his own good. He, he might, I think he drew the like a, a $10 from the ATM machine, but he still kept those winning money. And I interpret that as the recovery of the play spread. Remember the play definition, it was a fun. There is no end product or reward, just enjoying by doing it. So the spirit of play is to play well and it's on without being played. And play itself is the purpose. So this show projected uh, socioeconomic inequality and also the capitalism by using the children's game. And we all know that we are living in the winner takes all society. But my message to you guys, don't forget the moment that you had a fun when you play those child games when you're young with your siblings or friends. And that is the moment that we have to carry out in this society. There are so many challenges and there are so many things that you can be away from those play spread. And I asked my mom to find the, some of the pictures of me playing these games. And my mom said that was so many years ago, I don't have any of those pictures. So with modern technology, I totally forgot about what I said in here. I just put it myself into the deep competition and try to win the money. Uh, my face is a little bit different, but that's me, and I did my face swap. And that's all I have, and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Oh, it was a good, uh, great presentation. Uh, so your picture of a game also remind me of uh, my old game. I always lost money, so I'm uh, not the money, I lost game. So, <laughs> so anyway, nobody want to put me as uh, their team. So anyway, <laughs> it suddenly remind me a lot of my old memory. So okay, uh, as a second presenter, so I would like to invite uh, Dr. Charles uh, Matt, and then he will share about his uh, uh, research on the Squid Game. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. uh, 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 am I on mute? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm 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 pleased. Uh, glad to see everybody. Um, <laughs> I was expecting context. That's okay. Um, I, I, first of all, this paper begins and ends with the Dean's office. Thank you, Dean Schwang, and thank you, Ken Hahn. Um, Ken told me about Squid Game, and 
I was talking with Ken about it and uh, the Dean overheard us and said, hey, let's do a let's do a panel. I said, count me in. And I went home and started writing some notes and all of a sudden I've got this paper and it continues to write itself. So even some of the stuff I'm going to share today is, uh, is stuff beyond the initial uh, uh, paper. Um, I have a lot, there's a lot here. Um, I'm gonna try to, and, and I'm always seem to have more to say than I have time to say it in, but I'm gonna try to uh, uh, share some themes, seemingly disparate themes, but hopefully I can bring it all together in, in the time allotted. I wanna begin with a, a, a quote. I wanna begin with Walter Benjamin. Uh, uh, this is like the last note in his essay, um, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Uh, and he says, uh, and I apologize for reading this to you, but it's the only way I can uh, get through this. Uh, my mass reproduction is aided especially by the reproduction of masses in big parades and monster rallies in sports events and in war, all of which are captured by the camera. The masses are brought face to face with themselves. Mass movements are usually discerned more clearly by a camera than by the naked eye. A bird's eye view best captures gatherings of hundreds of thousands. The eye can do it, but a negative can be enlarged. This means that mass movements, including war, constitute a form of human behavior, which particularly favors mechanical equipment. This is, hopefully this is gonna make sense a little bit later on. For Benjamin, mass reproduction required the reproduction of masses. Now, post-industrial or late, late capitalism requires, sorry, we're all pathological narcissists now, I'll talk about that, maybe we'll get to that later, <laughs> to reproduce the self via social networking sites. For Benjamin, it was the enlargement of the, of the exposure of the film frame that allowed the masses to see themselves in the masses. For us, it is of a different scale. The blow up here is the proliferation of images of the masses as mass and the self-reproduction of the mass as mass. Uh, Benjamin talked about the aesthetics of politics and the illusion of power. Fascism allows for self-expression as long as the system is sustained. Social media now help reproduce the masses in a similar way that the blown up film negative did for Benjamin. Although Spike Lee is still blowing up images. If you happen to see, if you happen to see Black Klansman in a the theater, you saw him blow up images that were heretofore only on TV screens, smaller screens, iPhones, iPads, et cetera, et cetera, of Charlottesville. And it was shocking to see those images on the big screen um, in that context. That was just a shocking thing. So we're still blowing up images, but even more, even more shocking. Okay, so as I was watching Squid Game, I was also at the same time reading Zizek's uh, book, Everything You Wanted to Know About Lacan, But Were Afraid to Ask Hitchcock. <laughs> the greatest book title in the world. I'm sorry, it just is. And uh, I was also revisiting Krakur's uh, notion of the mass ornament. And then later on, I, I got deep into his other book, uh, From Caligari to Hitler. So, um, so some of this is from that. So. Um, so a lot of scholars put Hitchcock into three different phases. Um, and so we have different uh, phases of capitalism. We have how do these different phases of capitalism constitute or construct or interpolate, if we use out the sales term, the subjectivities within those phases. So we have these three types of uh, subjectivities and three distinct modalities of desire. Uh, for Hitchcock, first it's the, uh, the MacGuffin, nothing happening at all. It's an empty place to set the story in motion. The couple's initiatory voyage, voyage, obstacles, autonomy is strengthened through the ordeal. Second, we have object of exchange circulating among subjects. This is a guarantee upon on their symbolic relationship. The resigned paternal figure of the second stage evokes the decline of this autonomous hero to whom is opposed the uh, victorious insipid heteronomous hero. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. Third, this object has a massive oppressive material presence. It is not an indifferent void like the MacGuffin, but at the same time, this does not circulate between subjects. It is not an object of exchange. It is a mute embodiment of an impossible goal. Um, and so what I'm doing is, I'm con I, I, one of the things I've done, one of the many things I've done, I'm connecting the second and third periods of Hitchcock with the city and island respectively. For Zizek, the second period is marked by the predominance the insignia, the index of the father's impotence, a fragment of reality which functions as a signifier of the fact that the big other is barred, that the father is not able to live up to his name, to his symbolic mandate, insofar as he is caught up in, a, in, a, in an obscene of enjoyment. So for me, perhaps no other scene in the series, and you can help me with this because I, this is the most a recent thing that I've, I've been thinking about. 
Perhaps no other scene in the series signifies a father's impotence more than when he gives his daughter the gift of a lighter. <laughs> this fragment of reality, first this young person hardly needs a lighter. Uh, there is a shock of the real here. This object of exchange fails to register in the symbolic universe. The object is meaningless here and only signifies the couple's failure to bond. This failed exchange signifies the father's impotence despite all of its phallic weight. Instantaneous fire, instantaneous death, the really real, the father will experience his own shock of the real when on the island. Objects that will mute any pretense to exchange or meaning, massive objects that will blunt any notion of symbol of order. These exchanges when successful, this is my this is the last time I'm reading to you. This, these exchanges when successful reaffirm the coherence and logic of the symbolic universe. When they fail, as they often do in Squid Game City, they expose capitalism for the irrational, illogical, and immoral thing that it is. Th this is a shock of the real. The symbolic is exposed for the symbolism that it is, and the mystifications and the abstract value systems upon which the social order depends is exposed. I say Squid Game allows us to see that. So I want to go back. I'm just going to show a couple of things. Oh, here's the, <laughs> I talk a lot about space and spatial dialectics, but even when they're outside, they're inside. But Here's the scene where the father is giving her, his daughter the gift, and here's, here's, here's the gift, <laughs> the, the lighter. Anyway, so there are a couple of things here I want to talk about. Actually, um, oh, I, I, I well, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, so there's some parallels here. Um, parallel Hitchcock, Squid Game. Crocker, third object, massive oppressive material present, ornamental objects in the mass and the mass ornaments. Squid Games Island is Caligari's fair, I'm calling it. So I'm not going to read this whole thing to it. I just want to read the last sentence. Uh, Krakor says the fair in Caligari is not freedom, but anarchy entailing chaos. And I say to that, the island is not freedom, but the promise of freedom under the veneer of emotionally charged ornaments and also anarchy entailing chaos. So I'm drawing some parallels here too that. Weren't, weren't there in the first paper. Here's some other par here's some other parallels. Um, I don't think I need to get too much into that. But so let's let's go back. I'm going to go back here, and I'm just going to show you. I want to show some images. Of course, every this you know who doesn't love this. <laughs> um, this is um, uh, when I saw. Well, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm going to go over the place. I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to explain this in a second. Um, sorry. Ah. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so when I saw this, I'm sorry. When I saw this, I thought of Eisenstein's um, uh, 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 clip from uh, Battleship Potemkin, and there's a lot of talk about this because this is a this is an example of montage or dialectic when there's a similar frame because you got sailors on the bottom of the screen going left to right, and you got sailors at, at the top of the screen going right to left, and you got this kind of montage going on here. Here, there's a kind of controlled chaos too. The motion vectors, index vectors, graphic vectors are all over the place. So I do talk about that. I also talk about um, the the link. It goes back to the Escher-like stairs, but also I talk a little bit uh, uh, Piranesi's uh, series of etchings called the Prisons from 1747. So I just that's just I just picked that up. Uh, but here's some of the you know you'll recognize some of these images, the big object. So here uh, uh, let's let's go back. So in Hitchcock's third period, what are the big objects? Well, the birds, well, birds are small, but, the, but a big flock of birds killing you are large birds. Uh, the ship at the end of the street of Marnie, Marnie's mother's house, um, Mount Rushmore in North by Northwest, uh, the Sphinx and blackmail. Um, and so those are, those are the, that's the third period stuff. And then I kind of link those two, the big objects in Squid Game. So we have the gigantic emotionally charged Playground set. Of course, we have the gigantic ball. Of course, we have the robot doll. I talk about that. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and then I then I talk. I do talk about the mass, and I talk about space. But I just came up with, found some images. Uh, this is from Kurosawa's uh, one of Kurosawa's film. Uh, this is from Metropolis. Uh, I could only stomach to put one of these in, but here you go. This is kind of the, like the, so one of the points I'm trying to make. This is from Metropolis again, Squid Game again. Uh, oh, Battleship Potemkin, the sailors on the side, the officers in the middle, similar kind of uh, configuration here with the guards in the middle and the officers on the side. Kurosawa. Oh, I just, 
this just was happenstance. I, I saw this and oh, look, there, there we are again with big objects in the frame. And then this was just accidental too. Oh, this is from Metropolis. And oh yeah, we had this figure in Squid Game. This is uh, kind of a shocking thing. I, was, I did talk about Triumph of the Will. This is an image from Triumph of the Will at a night scene. And this is an image from Charlottesville. Uh, I was just shocked at the similarity between these two, two images. So I, so I do talk about that as well. Um, do I have like two, two more minutes? Oh, okay. So, so those are the big objects. The, small, the, the second period has to do with objects of exchange. So in the key and notorious, the cigarette lighter and strangers on a train. Um, oh, and then I connect these to the object of the exchange in the, in, the, uh, in the city. So you see that, you see this. Oh, he's happy about this. He's frustrated here because he wants an object to exchange with his daughter, but it doesn't uh, quite make it. So I link up these second and third periods in city island with small objects of exchange that, that falter, right? He wins at the racetrack, but he loses his money, right? So he can never hang on. So the symbolic order is always disrupted by the really real in all his actions in the city, uh, Metropolis. Okay. okay. I think that, so here's Statue of Liberty uh, and uh, Statue of Liberty, another gi gigantic object. If I've got one more minute, I'd just like to, um, well, I'm not gonna do that. I, I, there's, a, there's some uncanny parallels between how Krakur talks about the fair in, um, in Caligari and, and, it's, and how it also links up to uh, the island and, and Squid Game, but, but I feel like I might be out of time. Am I? Are we okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, are you done or? Oh yeah. Well, I, yeah. I I, I can st I can stop here, or I've, I've got uh, just because Dr. Ho talked about uh, play and games. This is what um, Crowker talked about with um, his, his reading of Caligari's uncanny parallel to uh, Squid Games Island. This accounts for the, okay, so I'm gonna just read. For adults, it is a, a regressive, a regression in early childhood days in which uh, games and serious affairs are identical. Real and imagined things mingle and anarchical desires aimlessly test infinite possibilities. By means of this regression to the adult, the adult escapes a civilization which tends to overgrow and starve out the chaos of instincts, escapes it to restore that chaos upon which civilization nevertheless rests. And then I compare the uh, island to the, um, uh, to, to the fair in Caligari. So anyway, um, that, that's pretty much it. There, there's, a lot, there's a lot there, but I, I was trying to condense a lot of different moving parts. Um, I hope that some of that made sense. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, it was a really great presentation. Actually, the, uh, I, uh, today I learned a lot from your presentation, actually, symbolic flows and then the implications. Yeah, Squid Game show a lot of uh, the symbolic uh, kind of uh, image representing capitalism, market competitions, and the psychological kind of uh, the feeling inside of those participants. Yeah, actually, but today the Dr. Uh, Matt kind of uh, explained those kind of uh, importance of those pictures uh, or image, uh, especially to me. A uh, really great learning to me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And then actually, the, I would like to invite uh, you know, Professor uh, Huang Bumiwang. Actually, the Bumiwang will introduce uh, more about uh, uh, another aspect, that means uh, the Korean culture and the language aspect to the uh, these interpretations. Thank you. So hi everyone. Thank you, um, Bin Chuang and. Uh, Emily and Diana for inviting me to the talk and thank you Dr. Yang introducing me. So today um, I'd like to start um, my talk by sharing a Korean music video titled A Thought at an Autumn Night in which you are invited to view the setting where the Korean games are played and who are the players. So I'm gonna share the screen to share the video. Um, give me just a sec. Thank you. 
Should are you seeing? Um, I hope you enjoy the video, music video. Leaving children playing after school in a middle class residential neighborhood was a common scene found in Korea until 20th century or before the wide use of smartphones and computers. The setting of the playground, as you have seen in the video, called Golmokgi in Korean, is a street surrounded by houses in the neighborhood where everyone knows everyone else in the community. The space could be small and narrow, but the sky is open and the aroma of meals prepared by each household fills up the street, letting children know that dinner is being ready and they need to wrap up their play. As you might be reminded of, Sangwoo's last dialogue. Sangwoo is one of the characters, one of the two last survival. Um, he said, when we were kids, we would play just like this, and our moms would call us in for dinner. And he added, but no one calls us anymore as he lies dying. The very Korean games played in Squid Game are plays called Nori in Korean. They are not games in the sense of competition. Of course, there are rules, but the rules of the play are minimal, harmless, and are made out of mutual respect. One example is what is called in Korean Akdugi. In Sweet Game is translated um, in English as the weakest link. And this term was introduced in episode six. I don't think the term is uh, the fully conveyed, I mean, the meaning wise. So if I explain what Kakugi is, so when children of a range of age and size come together, there are bound to be a couple of them who are particularly weak, small or slow. They are often the ones who will be eliminated the first when the game is played under the normal circumstance. However, when you have Kakugi, those can play together without worrying about losing. This is because being Kakugi, they are allowed to have a privileged skills, given many lives or will not be eliminated even when they are caught. Kakugi is a considerate culture created by Korean children to include the vulnerables into games. No one is left out. This particular, this practice reflects the social value of harmony, a key philosophy of Korean culture that underlies much of the behaviors of members of the society. These plays by children seem to enable them from early on to learn empathy that is essential for mutual understanding, to enjoy the camaraderie that are formed playing with each other and to form a sense of balance that is needed for a harmonious coexistence. Another aspect of these children's play has to do with the attitude and purpose of their spectators. Those who watch children play are caregivers and neighbors. They watch to enjoy, to encourage, and to share on with the satisfaction coming from seeing their youngsters have fun and grow. These plays become real, high stakes games and squid game. In the series, the players are supposed to go to the games voluntarily, but how voluntary is it if the alternative in the real world is the impossibility to face death 
and hence eventual destruction. Yes, the, place, the players may leave the place with a majority vote, but that seems to be a mockery of democracy, not a practice of it. Most importantly, the result of each game is the elimination of others. The games are no longer for the purpose of harmony, but for money and survival. You pay not to enjoy company with your friends. You compete with them for life. You continue existence. Your continued existence depends on the peril of your opponent. There is no balance. There is only opposition. We live in a highly capitalized society and whether or not we're conscious of it, we are driven to accept it. Equipped with remote controls and mice, we seem to be empowered to choose what to see and what to do. Ironically, however, it is these seeming freedom that renders us vulnerable. We are in fact controlled by an invisible hand, much like the players in Squid Game. We are the objects of the game of the rules. We are living in a world of elimination. So if the children's play on school playgrounds and neighborhoods are a representation of the past of a society that is essentially good, kind, and beautiful, the games in Squid Game are the, the opposite. It is a presentation of the present that is bad, evil, and ugly. But the bad, the evil and the ugly on a moment's reflection is somewhere deep in us. How many of us can say for sure that we will give up our lives readily so that another person can have theirs? It is harrowing and frightening indeed. The distorted reality of Korean Nori in play English. Nori culture seen in Squid Game is therefore the representation of what a modern person is facing. The overwhelming response from the viewers worldwide suggests its resonance with an audience that transcends people and cultures. The fictional world is no longer a fiction. Squid Game is a mirror of humanity. It is surely disturbing, but underneath that alarming disturbance is a chilling acknowledgement that what we see is no longer fictional. I would like to conclude my part of today's talk by quote by Johan Heisinga, historian, Dutch historian. Once you stop acknowledging the humanity of your opponents, it has ceased to be a game. It becomes barbarism. I'm looking forward to Squid Game 2, as many of you guys do uh, are. Um, personally hoping that my nostalgic memories of the times that I played all the games in the series can be restored to the way it was before I watched the series. To be honest, the way I see and feel about these games has been altered and not for the better. I hope Korean children can still enjoy these games and help us keep the little humanity that has remained in us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bomi Hwang. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, actually, the, again, the, uh, the, her presentation shared uh, social culture and literary implications uh, through the, uh, the Squid Game. Thank you again. Okay, so uh, then our last presentation uh, will be uh, uh, handled by Dr. Beck. Uh, so Dr. Beck actually uh, will give us presentation regarding uh, media and entertainment business. Thank you, go ahead. Hi, I'm Mo Bak, not Beck. Uh, do I have time to present? 
Oh, I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Let me use uh, the uh, you uh, share my screen. Are you looking at my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, those were excellent presentations. Uh, let me talk about Squid Game in a, a little more plain terms. Uh, my title is uh, Appears and Impacts of Squid Game. Here's what I think has happened. Uh, Squid Game is a nine episode serial drama directed by Hwang Dong Hyuk, Korean, released in, uh, on September 17th last year by Netflix. It's known to be Netflix's most viewed show of all time and number one most watched show in more than 90 countries, watched by more than 140 million households worldwide and uh, the in the drama uh, you know a lot of people uh, are killed but they were not actually killed the actors were not killed but here's uh, something happened uh, uh, in uh, North Korea uh, someone uh, you know smuggling uh, the drama was actually being killed All right, so uh, here, here, here are a few factors. Uh, Netflix uh, released that drama, okay? Netflix has more than 200 million subscribers in 190 countries. And the South Korean drama uh, riding on the Korean wave, Hallyu, and the recognition of Oscar winning film, Parasite, uh, was dubbed in 13 languages and subtitled in 31 languages. Uh, helped by media symbiosis, uh, magazines, newspapers, radio, and television also talk about that uh, drama that helped, and also social media. Uh, one study uh, reported that uh, more than 50% of Squid Game viewers first heard about the drama by social media. And also word of, mo word of mouth, texting, messaging, and uh, uh, my wife uh, told me about it, so <laughs> the word of mouth is yes, another uh, way. Uh, all right, content was interesting. Storyline, concepts, and visuals are unique, fresh, and fascinating. Games were exciting to watch, and settings were intriguing. And plot development and twist, very suspenseful. Uh, Korean. Uh, drama producers are, are very skilled in uh, making each episode, uh, you know, uh, especially the ending, you know, that makes people uh, to come back, you know, make, make people come back, you know, to watch the epi ep next episode. So uh, well produced in that sense and actors and characters were attractive. Yeah, like this one of the characters. Uh, Jung, Jung Ho Yeon uh, became very popular and uh, she, she was uh, seen attractive. Uh, and representation of humanity uh, in radical ways. And the drama was showing some aspects of uh, modern living, like urbanization, uh, materialism, money-driven society, uh, classism, uh, inequities between haves and have-nots, sexism, gender inequity, yeah, women were discriminated against and even in playing games. But some of the uh, female characters are uh, uh, presented some strong images, you know, fighting, you know, uh, the re uh, claiming uh, the e equity Competition, there are a lot of competition, uh, uh, fair, but not really fair. Depersonalization, uh, 
people were treated as just a uh, uh, given numbers and they were calling numbers play a 456 and you know uh, just like some people in our society you know, that treated as inconsequential uh, surveillance yeah people are uh, being watched like you know maybe in the future you know we are, will all be surveilled you know uh, with the techn technologies advanced you know we may be getting some traffic tickets uh, the next morning because they know uh, how fast we drove the, the, the day before. <laughs> My view. Uh, nostalgia for humanness. Yeah, so throughout the drama, you know, some characters will, you know, keep asking uh, whether uh, life should be like that, you know. Uh, so that's what we feel these days. Impacts, entertainment. Uh, the Saturday Night Live had this uh, interesting. Let's see. Uh, we don't have much time, so you, you can watch it. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, clip. So, the drama's impact could be on the uh, viewer's views on life, meanings of life, values, relationships, beliefs, and attitudes, and orientations, life orientation, also, and also social distrust. Yeah. Uh, media is going to talk about mean world syndrome yeah, proposed by cultivation theories. Uh, social distrust. And also, there they can be impacts on uh, the viewer's perception of or interest in Korean people and culture, and also recognition of Korean drama and actors. My next guest is an actor you know as player four, five, six from the Netflix show. Yeah. Career and also Jimmy Fallon. My next guests are the stars of the biggest television show in the world, Squid Game. It is streaming now on Netflix. Here are. Okay, so <laughs> sorry, I can't share the video clips. Uh, so, impacts uh, as a social scientific uh, scholar, a uh, uh, researcher. I uh, use some theoretical framework called the uh, uh, Advanced Effects Model of Fictional Media. Uh, so there are four factors I look at. Uh, I use a boxing analogy uh, to explain what these factors are like. Uh, media involvement is like a distance between boxers. Like, you know, no matter how uh, strong the punch is, if the target box is too far away, the impact would be not much. And perceived realism, like thinness of globe pads, the thinner the globe pad, the greater the imp impact of a punch. It's like a perceived realism. Uh, you know, how much, how realistic the viewer perceives the content to be, that affects the level of effect, impact. Uh, role affinity is like uh, uh, defensive effort, uh, lack of defensive effort. When, when, when someone really likes a character uh, in a drama or movie, you know, whatever the character you know, does or, you know, says, you know, will impact the viewers, okay? So all of this is that uh, factor. And subject novelty is another factor. You know, how familiar uh, the viewer uh, is with what is portrayed, okay? If what is portrayed is really novel to them, that'll generate much greater impacts, okay? So uh, I'm gonna be conducting some research this summer. Uh, you know, testing this theory. Uh, so my last words in this presentation could be to be continued, okay? I think we have like a couple of minutes uh, left. I try my best. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bae. Back. Okay, so. Okay, so yeah, thank you for your presentation. Actually, Dr. Beg actually shared the more implications from the Squid Game. 
and also the share the the, the ramification of uh, this uh, the the impactful uh, drama series. Okay, so from now on, actually, we have uh, we do not have a lot of minutes, but however, actually, the, we are willing to take some questions. Okay, so if you have any questions, I can please show emotion of hands up, and then actually I'll go for one by one. Okay, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank you for all presenter. Um, here is my uh, reaction after I watched the TV show. First, game players are all better. Unemployed North Korean refugee, fraudulent investors. I think from the finance faculty's viewpoint, almost take personal finance class, finance 1001. And I cannot agree with the game players to take part in the kill over to be killed game. I think life is more valuable than money. Some critics in the media I read argued against the capitalism, that is the economic system, but I think the problem is wrong value system, namely materialism, or we can call money worship. That is the problem. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your understanding. Okay. Uh, any, any panelists that you want to share more feeling or any response regarding Dr. Kim's uh, uh, point? Uh, I, I agree uh, with Dr. Kim. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with him. And uh, uh, here's uh, something I, I, I can say, and uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, we are all playing games, all playing games. The prize may not be uh, money, but something that can, that we think can make us happy or less happy, okay? So I hope you are, uh, all uh, win those games that you are playing now. But uh, I have realized that uh, in some games, losing brings us longer lasting happiness. That's what I want to say. Thank you. OK, so. Uh, okay, how about uh, another question coming up? Uh, Jocelyn or Mon Monji? Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. I really watched the Squid Games when it was trending, and I think this was really interesting. Um, I'm a graduate student in the communications department, and I just wanted to ask, I mean, I know we're out of time, but, um, you know, what does this say about, like, the American public and, you know, how this show really, you know, hit a lot of viewers. And, you know, I just, I'm curious of like, what does this mean? Like in the bigger picture of society and like, you know, getting into these games and the violence and the suspense and everything and the drama. Um, I know I was a consumer of that. I was like, I wanna know what happens next or who's gonna die and all that stuff. So, um, you know, I just had a question, like what, what does it mean? Like um, seeing how this was such a big hit Yes. Can, I, can I can I take a shot at that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and this may be a shot at both comments. Um, I was reading an essay, and uh, the essay is titled "Why the Past Year Ten Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid." And in the essay, there's a passing comment about the Edelman Trust Barometer. And the author just happens to speak about the idea that both South Korea and the United States are at the bottom of the uh, of this barometer, and it's like it measures international uh, trust in business, trust in media, trust in institutions, um, and um, we're we're at the bottom, but we're above Russia. But I, I just out of curiosity, I looked at the, the the democracy index that's put out by the Economist, the intelligence unit of the Economist, and in 2020. I was just curious, um, South Korea was ranked number 23 uh, in terms of democracy index. And that they, they measure things like trust in institutions. 
we were the United States was ranked number 25. Number 20, number 25 is in the flawed democracy category. So maybe one of the things we share, right, is that we're both in weak, struggling, contentious democracies. And that's how that's how why some of this stuff resonates so well with so many uh, across so many different borders. That's, that's uh, which, my, my which country opinion. ranked number one, Iraq? Who's number one? Well, the, 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 of course, the Scandinavian countries are up there. Ah. Uh, Canada's up there. Taiwan, I think, is up there. So yeah, there's a, there's a big, big healthy group in the front. We're, we're lagging. We're lagging. We're a flawed democracy. And, uh, and South Korea is just at the bottom of the, the full democracy group. So, so that may be one reason why some of this stuff resonates across so many borders so well. Anyway, that's just my answer to that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how about uh, any any other panelists uh, want to respond? Who want to respond? No? OK, so actually, the, my other interpretation is uh, this drama also share uh, what is going on in our, of course, it's dramatized, but actually, it's kind of a share kind of a, the extreme cases. So actually, on the, uh, right now, actually, our campus and community really promote uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, in, in, so in other words, we try to build up new culture for everyone and then build up trust among us. So this is kind of a, a, one of the information I would like to share with everyone. OK, uh, next question is, uh, is Al Alvan? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you to uh, everyone for this wonderful panel. It is quite interdisciplinary. It's quite, um, it, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see such great uh, viewpoints from such great disciplines. As, of course, a media studies person, you know, my questions are going to be for my media studies colleagues. Um, and, it, you know, I have a, a specific question for especially Dr. Metz. First of all, Rod, uh, congratulations on your top paper award. Um, it, it is a, a wonderful paper, it seems, uh, from your presentation, fantastic parallels. Um, I was wondering uh, the two things. One, if you could elaborate more on the impact of this superimposing certain images like the so what kind of effect does that create uh, in the text and in terms of the viewer experience? Um, and especially, and, and, you know, in general, like uh, you showed us other examples of like the, um, you know, Mount um, Rushmore or, or, or that um, the, the ship and et cetera. So traditionally in media studies, you know, how does that play out? And in Squid Game, does it play out in, in, in a different way or does it fulfill the same function, I was wondering. Um, and the second one um, that I'm wondering um, is, there is just, you showed us so many similarities um, between Squid Game, uh, the, in its visual representations in general with Lots of different uh, iconic texts um, from, you know, Russia to American, you know, films. Um, to me, I mean, as a, of course, a scholar of, of global media and, and communication, to me, that's a, you know, um, great example and great reason for why, um, you know, Korean, the K way um, and Korean media, you know, have become. It's such a great, you know, powerhouse, both in terms of, you know, kind of Asian regional media uh, landscape and at the same time global media landscape, because it can, you know, speak with, you know, like using a very local game, um, you know, children's game in Asia, using that and, and kind of making it, you know, um, something else. I mean, it can speak within Asia right, uh, inter-Asia, and then it can also speak transnationally, trans-Asia. So it does it so wonderful. So this also, the second question is pretty much a question for, for, for everyone in that sense. You know, what do you all think about um, these kind of, you know, how um, Korean media and culture have become so important in, you know, kind of global, you know, media landscape and, and in, in what ways you see uh, the, the squid game is capable of, of doing that, especially the, you know, 
um, and one example, of course, Dr. Metz's um, presentation gave us, which is references to, right, um, lots of, you know, uh, iconic global um, visual materials. Sorry, this has become almost a <laughs> commentary and at the same time, and, you know, questions, but it is exciting, you know, so for a, for a you know, global media studies person, this is a very, very exciting panel. So thank you. Okay. Well, I, I forgot your first question. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, I, I think uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to say is like the, 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 big, the big objects, right? The big objects on the island are the things that stop down the desires, right? On, on the, in the city, the, the objects of exchange um, sustain this idea that the symbolic order is of order. And um, it is a pawn in that game. And it, as long as those things work, we delude ourselves into thinking, oh, the order is the order. The, the, the social order is an order, but it's really not. It's, it's the symbolic, right? You, you know, I'm sure you, you look, uh, just, this is Lacanian stuff, right? And then we get to the real, the really real, the shock of the real that is metaphorically or allegorically played out on the island with the big objects. Well, the really real is, uh, not symbolic. There's no such thing as this social exchange. It's just it's just this thing that prevents um, prevents order. And I think part of part of this stuff is like the inability to imagine some of the contours of freedom. Right? It's like okay, so I'm not free on the I'm not really free in the city. I'm not really free on the island. Can I imagine another space where I might be free? I think the idea about objects too is that they're they are emotionally charged, right? Especially the playgrounds, things, all the things from childhood on the island that are blown up, right? Gigantic things that prevent you from from attaining your goal. Um, it's just uh, it just exaggerates that uh, the really real, right? The really real is well, you know. Um, we can try to sustain the symbolic order, but it's really symbolic. It really means symbolic. It's not the really real. So that, like that's the, kind of what I was trying to get at. I hope that kind of answers that a little bit. Like the big brother is big. Oh yeah. It's visually oh, yeah. big. Yeah. You know, it's it, not the, you know, big brother because it is, you know, it and when you butt up against, is. yeah. When you butt up against that, that's it. When birds, when the birds come down, that's it. Right. When the, that's it. Uh, that's it. The, 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 the couple can't come together. Everything's out, out of order. Uh, because the really real has intervened into the symbolic. I don't know. That's how I read. That's how I kind of read that. I hope that gets close. I hope that gets close. Thank you. So any panelists who would respond to the second questions regarding the kind of a why the Korean drama? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so that's interesting. So the uh, director of, of, of Parasite, of course, has I don't know what there's a shot there's a there's a shot of a, a, a scene where Hitchcock there's a Hitchcock film in the uh, you know so you 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 know he uh, uh, is it's a kind of an homage to Hitchcock uh, there so there there is a, an international dialogue going on uh, you know uh, uh, there there's there is yeah absolutely <laughs> I think what I wanted to ask was that does Squid Game do that even better than uh, a lot of the other uh, television shows, Korean television shows, or the, you know, films, uh, right? I mean, it, do we see even a more skillful example? It's like, uh, you know, why did Squid Game become such a, you know, high point, right? So that's kind of also what I was wondering, if the, does Squid Game do that even better, that di dialoguing, oh, you know, yeah. bringing all the, you know, global visual imagery and memories into something that is completely also uh, local uh, yeah. to the core at the same time, right? I, I think, uh, you know, uh, what we saw in the drama was, uh, you know, it's a great piece of entertainment, you know, uh, people are curious about what happens in their surroundings. And, you know, just like on freeways, you know, uh, you know, there's a car crash, you know, people keep watching, you know, and also whenever there's a police uh, chasing a, a car running away, you know, they keep showing it. Also it's boring and people keep watching to see what happens at the end, you know, but this drama has a unique, really unique, fascinating, you know, uh, storyline you know that's what made people uh, you know a lot of people want to watch you know 
what happens next, what happens next, right? Yeah. So uh, it was a big piece of entertainment. I, mean, I, I, I didn't have time to uh, show uh, you that uh, SNL clip. Would you like to see it? It's just a couple of minutes. Uh, okay. Would you allow me to show that uh, SNL clip? Uh, it was really funny. Dr. Yang? Oh, I'm sorry. But, uh, yes. The video. Oh. oh. I'm sorry, I, I, I lost video last sentence. SNL video? Uh, uh, well, um, sure. Yeah. But at the same time, maybe if you if you, you link that, it seems um, Dr. Chan has a question also. Yeah. Oh, OK, yeah, OK. If you could yeah, Chen, share the ahead. link Dr. for Chen. us um uh, through chat that would be fantastic yeah okay. oh, I, I can't yeah. wait no problem yeah. Yeah. i don't yeah, share the link the chat. Chat. Yeah, that might be a good idea to share the link with the chat box and then yeah, can, uh, yeah we can go to next two questions uh, dr chen actually what is your uh questions well i i i have all the answers for you guys and you're talking about why this series is so popular of course, I agree with everything that has been said. But for me, as a viewer, one of the millions of out there, my like of something, and or rather the impact for me to go back again is quite simple. That is, it makes me think and it poses a question that I cannot answer. I think that probably is part of it. For example, the very last scene of the series, of the first, uh, first series, the two friends were fighting for life. Only one will survive. That left in me, I couldn't sleep because I do not know what I would do. Now, I'm going to view Duman Kim and my friend today, only for today. Now, if put Duman Kim and me in a spot, I genuinely don't know. I love the man came, okay? I know that he will kill me, but I'm not sure I will not put up a fight. I think I'll try to kill him. Now, I don't know the rest of you think. For me, I do not know the answer. All I know is I do not know how I would behave when I'm placed in that context. And for this particular reviewer, I think that is one of the probably a reason why it draws so much audience to itself. All right, that's from the grumpy old man, and, and thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so the any committee want to respond or? Okay, then. I think, well, I think that's a great point. That's a great point. That, that is a great point. It, it's it's the existential philosophical thing, right? Reflection on what would you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matt. Okay, so because of the time, actually, we will receive last two questions, and then yeah, actually yeah. we will, uh, yeah, close it, our meeting. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Young, yeah, yeah, Dr. Young, it's not a question, but I want to respond. Uh, Mm -hmm. Dr. Elgin's question, uh, why Korean movie, Korean drama become popular? Mm -hmm. This is my opinion. In some Western movie, action movie, everything is action. And some melodrama, everything is a melodrama. I think a key point of Korean drama or movie is show both. Internal emotion of a human being is expressed very well, not only verbally, but also by face movement, body language. Second thing is, it has action. It combined together very well. And third point I would like to make from Japanese audience is, Japanese never express their inner heart to anyone their whole life. On the other hand, even though it looks same, Korean Express, straightforward. So movie as a whole or drama as a whole has get to the point. 
express what we want to say from the producer's viewpoint and makes it interesting. There is no moment you can just walk away and come back and they can catch up very fast pace. And a lot of question is raised by drama. What do you think? Do you agree with this particular point of this person or not, as Dr. Rong Chen says? So it makes think also with action, it's entertaining. I think that is the key point of Korean movie and drama became popular. That's all. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, actually, the, I think we uh, we passed uh, more than 20 minutes after our selected time. So actually, the, I believe actually we have to adjourn our meeting uh, for everyone. But again, actually, before we wrap up our uh, meeting, actually, I want to say thank you, uh, panelist members, and also uh, Dr. Chuang, uh, Ruling uh, Chuang, a dean, and also the uh, many participating faculty and students. Uh, thank you, everyone. So we will adjourn our meeting and then actually hope to see second round of meeting again in the future. <laughs> Bye, everyone. I